Welcome everyone to another episode of Busy Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Julian Hayes II, and I'm here with another fantastic and awesome guest. And we're going to talk about a lot of things that I love and things that are actually very top of mind for a lot of us now. Um, you know, even if you've been living under a rock, I'm sure you've heard about the coronavirus and COVID and also, and it's affected all of our lives. It's probably one of the few times in the history of the world where every single person that's walking this planet right now has been affected and has a story that they'll be able to talk about and down the years later. But before I get to my guest, and my guest is Dr. Andrew Myers. He is a naturopathic physician who has been in practice since 1993. He is also one of the world's experts when it comes to the formulation of dietary supplements. He's also the co-author along with Dr. Grace McComsey of the book, Simplifying the COVID Puzzle, How Two Essential Vitamins Fortify the Immune System. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the book cover. It's in my hand. It's hard. It's hardcover as well, which I love, um, but I'll save that for another day in that discussion. But without further ado, Dr. Myers, how are you doing today? Let's see. Dr. Myers, how is it going? It's going great, Julian. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yes, I'm excited for you to be here as well and to talk about this um this book because it you know, I you it's a very important time to talk about this. You know, health is at the forefront of a, everyone's mind right now, most likely. But before we dive into the book, let's get to know you a little bit and your origin story. So what got you interested in medicine and health? Well, interestingly for me, I was always kind of a healthy person, healthy kid. I didn't eat candy as a kid. I never took any medications, didn't drink alcohol. And I was a, uh, I studied molecular biology as my undergraduate degree. And I was working in a genetics lab preparing for conventional medical school. And uh, I was walking down the hall in the biology department one day and saw a flyer for naturopathic medical school. This is before the internet. I sent in, a, actually got a printed catalog. And when I read the philosophy of naturopathic medicine, I knew immediately that, that the idea of treating people naturally working within the boundaries of nutrition and physical medicine and lifestyle. Those were all the things that I lived in my own life philosophically. And so I, I took the leap. And although I, uh, like you, I uh, applied to conventional medis medical school and took the MCATs and, and did the interviews, I ultimately decided that I wanted to be a naturopathic physician. And uh, for me, it's been a lifelong passion, and it's been probably the best decision I've ever made in terms of having alignment with my personal feelings and my professional career. So uh, I learn something new and wonderful about the body every single day. New research, new understanding, and it just fuels my interest every day about nutrition and how we can do better in terms of improving our health and wellness. Yeah, I still have nightmares over the MCAT. I still have. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I could write. I'm glad I could write an essay. And I had a lot of different extracurricular hobbies and stuff to show I was a well rounded individual because my MCAT score did not indicate my my actual know all I don't know what it was about that test. But that test made me start to question it. Am I actually maybe I shouldn't do this. I don't know because but um, I, I'm glad it wasn't just based on the MCAT. I'll just say that. Because, oh, my yeah. goodness. Well, I, I but, think um, it's an antiquated tool based on, on the way that we should be practicing medicine. It's, uh, to me, it's, a, it's irrelevant and it's a, a relic of an age that uh, really needs to go away. 
obviously, you know, my belief system as related to conventional medicine is very different. And certainly COVID has been a, a, an incredible example of a, a medical system that uh, overlooks and actually just has missed the boat completely in terms of an opportunity to help people understand that they have this incredible immune system. And with a few simple changes in terms of lifestyle and nutritional supplementation, they could make a huge difference in terms of their susceptibility to a really big problem like COVID-2 and, and COVID-19. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I mentioned this to a couple of friends long time, a few months into the pandemic. And I told him this was such a unique time in history because never will you have everyone paying attention to one thing. And this is an opportunity to really shift the paradigm when it comes to health and, and going, looking just beyond a virus, but just thinking about the well-being of, of our people, you would never have this opportunity to really shift that paradigm and educate people. And I think they missed the ball on that. Okay, so we were talking about the medical community um, before we had a little technical mishap. And I was talking about how I think there's a, it was a prime opportunity for us to really educate the masses when it and shift the paradigm of health when it came when it comes to just naturally taking care of ourselves and not just relying on any um, pharmaceutical or anything. And what do you think about that? Do you think that time has sailed, or do you think we can still shift the paradigm with that? Well, obviously, to your point, we missed an enormous opportunity to educate the US population and the world to the fact that we have an immune system on board that is a defensive mechanism that is fueled by nutrition. And that most Americans immune systems are deficient. Let's face it, you know, we're approaching 600,000 deaths secondary to COVID-19. This is an unbelievable number and it's a tragedy. And I feel awful about it because the reality is, is that our immune systems were designed to fight off viruses like this. And whether it's an unhealthy lifestyle with lack of exercise, a poor dietary intake, or just frank nutritional deficiency, because you don't have availability of high quality foods based on your economic status or where you live in the world. These are issues that could have been addressed and, and someone from the medical community, the administration should have stood up and said, look, there is some basic nutrition here that we can take advantage of that will bolster your immune system while we try and figure out a solution, whether that solution was the vaccine or medical care. This was the chance to say, let's get healthy America and here are the things that we need to do to get your immune system on track and at least give you a better defense system against this virus, which is really about to kick our butts. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And so speaking of the immune system, let's dive into that. And let's, I guess, let's establish just the basic parameters of an immune system. So we hear the word immune system, but how would you exactly explain that to someone who like, it can, when I say, when I say, when I think of immune system, I think of a lot of things. I can start thinking of the in it, the adaptive, and how that breaks down as well. How would you explain that in a nutshell? I would take a step back and be even more simple. We have cells in our body that specialize in defending us from viruses and bacteria. And remember that we have billions of bacteria in our own body. We have trillions of bacteria in our own body. In fact, we have more bacteria in our digestive system than we have cells in our body. About 70% of our immune function is in our digestive system just because of that. But in the world at large, our immune system is basically a set of cells that are designed to recognize dangers from the outside world and deal with them and protect us from becoming infected by viruses. The, the human virome is like 300 trillion viruses that we're exposed to every day. So we have these specialized cells that basically protect us. And we have different versions. Yes, we have the innate system, but 
as we get into that kind of complexity, people start to get confused. Like, well, which part of my immune system is responding, innate or adaptive? Well, it doesn't really matter because we have this great suit of armor called the immune system that are specialized cells that take care of us in terms of protecting us from the outside world and the inside world. Because guess what? It's not just bacteria and viruses that the immune system kills, it's cancer cells. Mm -hmm. You know, we have circulating cells called natural killer cells or NK cells that surveil the body for cancer. And they, they destroy probably a million cancer cells a day in the average individual. So the, the immune system is a set of cells that are defensive in their orientation and they protect us from the outside world, principally bacteria and viruses. And so as we further go down this, this journey of talking about the immune system, um, we can hear, we of course want people to eat healthy, but there's a thing, there's a distinction that you all made and you brought up in the book as well, where you're talking about nu nutrient deficiencies. Whereas, so the spinach that I eat today that I put in my smoothie, it has vitamin K in it. It has, I think it has, it has a, I forgot the exact ratios of everything else in it. But the amount that I get today, this morning, when I had that smoothie, compare that to maybe 40 years ago, it's not going to be the same amount. Is that correct? Yeah, the, there's research that was published within the last decade that shows that uh, the vegetables and fruits that we consume under general growing conditions do not contain the nutrition that foods grown 30, 40 years ago did. Conventional agriculture has mined the soil of the nutrition. It hasn't been replaced. We don't have, we have dirt, not live soil. Obviously, if you choose organic, if you choose foods that are grown in a, in a much better system outside of conventional agribusiness, those nutrient deficiencies are going to, those nutrient levels are going to improve and can help prevent deficiency. But the issue is really the standard American diet. For, for those of us who are oriented towards organic and plant-based diets, you know, knowing that dark leafy greens are a critical part of our daily diet, generally speaking, we're going to be better on that spectrum of nutritional intake. It's really the average American who's eating fast food, who's eating processed foods, who's shopping in grocery stores and buying most of their foods in boxes and packages, who... Is they're just not getting the nutrition that they need across a broad range of nutrients. Americans are deficient not only in vitamin D and vitamin K2, but we know there's widespread deficiency in magnesium. There are individuals that can be deficient in zinc and selenium. And those are all critical nutrients that are required for optimal immune function. Mm -hmm. Most of us are not deficient in vitamin C. However, vitamin C levels need to be in the gram dosages or thousands of milligrams to actually promote immune function and to deal with the kind of uh, free radical and, and oxidative stress that we put our bodies under every day with the kind of foods that we eat and the stress that we endure with our lifestyle. Yes. Um, actually, speaking of vitamin C, that is something that I, I take one to two times a day in, in the um, high grams for that very reason, um, just because the more stressful lifestyle that you live, and when we talk about stress, it's not necessarily just thinking about work or relationships, but it's also for listeners out there who exercise a lot, that's a stressor as well. So you have to look at the whole picture of stress. And, and so I'm glad you brought up that point about vitamin C and because a lot of times you would think, well, I eat an orange a day or I have orange juice. And I was like, that's not nearly enough in, in the big picture of things. In, in reality, look, the, the, our lifestyle today, in terms of the stress that we endure, and it's a lot more stress than we've ever endured before, because it's not just positive stress, you, you know, like exercise or negative stress like work or finances or relationships. It's environmental stressors pollutants, toxins, chemicals that are in our environment 
that our body is dealing with every day. They're in most of the foods that people eat. You know, glyphosate is now in, you know, we know it's in oats. We know it's in, in products that people are eating. These are chemical stressors that our body has to deal with. And the way that we deal with stress is by giving up nutrition. We burn through antioxidant nutrition like vitamin C whenever we have a chemical or a pollutant or an environmental issue that our body deals with. And so the burden of stress is creating a much higher need for optimized nutrition, which is why I have become over the course of my career, uh, you know, a true believer in terms of supplementation. Mm -hmm. I eat a really healthy diet. I eat organic foods, mostly plant-based, basically just plants and fish. And I still supplement to the degree that I know is necessary because there's too much in the world that I'm exposed to that's going to impact my health if I don't have that extra nutrition on board. And it's hard to, for most of us, and I'm talking about myself a lot here, is that I'm kind of a robot eater. So I eat a very healthy diet but I eat mostly the same foods on a day by day basis. And so if I just relied on that, there's obviously a lot of key minerals and vitamins that I'm probably not getting enough of. And that's where that supplement regimen comes in and covers those bases. Absolutely. It's a great insurance policy and you're very, it's very true. We, we do tend to fall into patterns of eating. You know, I, when I sit down with a patient and, and talk about, you know, how best to structure a diet, eat from the rainbow. Mm -hmm. Every color of every fruit, every color of every vegetable represents a different nutrient component that is concentrated in that food and it's by color. And we have to eat a broad range of foods and a broad range of colors in foods to get the different nutritional components that those foods concentrate and draw from the soil. It's very hard because it's, we, we kind of get stuck in patterns, but supplementation combined with that sort of broader eating pattern or technique is really a critical approach. Yeah. And speaking of supplementation, let's talk about the two main vitamins that this book is based on and that the research that um, was done is based on, which was um, pretty eye-opening. It's, it's good to see that there's research on it, even though if you inherently know in your gut that it's going to do something it's good to have that backing as well so um we know a lot we hear vaccines we hear social distancing but we don't hear about vitamin d and k2 and yeah. so let's start with them i guess why are those two even important in the first place and in, in relation to covid and everything going on Late 2019, early 2020, uh, as the virus really started to gain a foothold around the globe, research started to percolate about a relationship between vitamin D deficiency and COVID outbreaks. And there was a, a number of researchers who started to correlate patterns of where you lived in the world, so higher latitudes, meaning higher frequency of vitamin D deficiency, and the rate of COVID infection. In fact, early on, there is even some talk that, oh, well, COVID's not going to be a big deal in equatorial countries because it doesn't like the heat. Or, you know, those folks get a lot of sun in, around the equator, and we're not going to see that occur. Obviously, that's not the case. But it did trigger some, some understanding that there was a link between vitamin D deficiency and COVID susceptibility. And that early research started to gain momentum as people began to look at the relationship between vitamin D deficiency and COVID. And it became very clear early on there was a, there was a link there. Now, for, for Dr. McComsey and I, one of the things that, that I know from my work in the nutrition field for many, many years is that when you have vitamin D deficiency, there is a high probability that there will also be vitamin K2 deficiency. And we need to talk a little bit about K1 versus K2, but K2 deficiency and vitamin D deficiency go hand in hand because these two nutrients function synergistically. It, it's like a relay race. If calcium is the baton in the race, vitamin D actually hands the calcium baton off to K2 to finish the race and do the job in terms of 
calcium management in the body. The same is actually true with regards to immune function. Vitamin D and vitamin K2 work together to regulate and support immune function, specifically, as in the case of COVID, as it relates to inflammation and the effects of inflammation on target organs like the lung and blood vessels. So Dr. McComsey and I knew about this interrelationship between vitamin D3 and vitamin K2, and we wanted to understand whether we could actually demonstrate from a research perspective that there was a, an independent effect in terms of deficiency of these nutrients. And that's what we sought out to do with the research that we completed at the University Hospital System and Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, based on that research and the research findings, we were so impressed that we decided to write the book Simplifying the COVID Puzzle, but it was based on our research findings that we actually decided to write the book. Yeah, that's um, that was eye-opening because the, the two main, I guess two of the most serious symptoms that we hear when it comes to COVID is lung damage and these thromboembolisms, correct? Correct. And so- yeah, so. Let's talk about that a little bit. In terms of the response of the body, let me just walk you through really quickly. Initially, vitamin D is involved in the COVID response because we know that vitamin D is involved in the maturation of immune cells. And vitamin D and vitamin K2 both regulate an inflammatory chemical mediator called NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B kind of sits atop this this cascade of other inflammatory chemicals that lead to the cytokine storm. So at the front end of a COVID infection, we see vitamin D being active. We see vitamin D helping to sort of stimulate the immune system's response. We also see it playing a role in terms of limiting NF-kappa B, which helps to slow the inflammatory process, K2 working the same. As we go downstream, and the virus proceeds in terms of the infection, K2 is there to block other inflammatory chemical mediators like interleukins that are going to drive the cytokine storm. So vitamin K2 in terms of the body's response modulates inflammation when K2 levels are present. As the cytokine storm begins to expand, as that inflammatory reaction begins to expand, we see it impacting the lungs. Now, originally, everyone thought, well, it's, it's an inflammatory response in the lungs. Yes, but that inflammatory response impacts a specific molecule called elastin. And one of the reasons why COVID patients have problems with their lungs is that they become less elastic. And elastin is the fiber that keeps the lung tissue elastic and flexible so that we can actually expand our lungs and breathe. Well, that elastin fiber under the influence of inflammation gets impregnated with calcium and it's K2 that manages calcium in the body. So if you get COVID and you're deficient in K2, you have a higher risk of lung based severe reaction because you don't have the K2 to prevent the calcium from impregnating the fibers of your lungs. The same is true in terms of your vascular system and thromboembolism. K2 outside of the liver prevents embolisms from occurring by regulating and supporting endothelial health and function, which is the thin layer of cells that line our blood vessels and keep blood flowing optimally. So whereas vitamin D is, in, is incredibly important at the front end of the infection, as is K2, as we move down the chain and the infection continues, K2 takes over in terms of being the superstar with regards to preventing severity of response under COVID. So really quick, what our research showed was if you're deficient in D and you're deficient in K2 independently, you have a higher risk for infection and you have a higher risk for severity of infection, potentially leading to severe outcomes, including death. Wow. You know, and I don't know if they can, if there will be a study on this, but I have a handful of family members who have asthma and I'm just wondering, cause I know that's another potential, you know, red flag as well. And I just wonder if that would, you know, this helps us 
people in general, I wonder how much it would help those that have severe asthma when it comes to D3 and K2. It's a really, it's a great question. And it's a very logical thread to, to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that our research now is, is going to spawn for us is as we move through the COVID phase and into additional research, we now can look at asthma as an inflammatory condition within the lungs and whether a deficiency, a chronic deficiency in D and K2 makes individuals more susceptible to the symptoms of asthma. We all know that asthma is a progressive condition, that you may start using an asthma inhaler when you're young, but as you get older, you have to use that inhaler more and more, mm -hmm. more frequently, higher dosages. And what my belief system would say is that the progression of deficiency only gets worse and is magnified as we age. And if you at some point don't intercede, whether it's in COVID or in asthma or any other condition, if you don't intercede and say, I've got to refill my nutritional buckets, I've got to get sufficient in D, I've got to get sufficient in K2, mm -hmm. your body can never heal itself. It can never do what it's naturally capable of in terms of regulating and controlling things like the inflammatory response that drives asthma. And I think there's probably a, a pretty good research base that says asthma and vitamin D deficiency go together, mm -hmm. especially in certain populations. And if there's D deficiency, I can guarantee you there's a K2 deficiency as well. And that is part of that overall uh, problem with regards to inflammatory modulation that you, it's your family members and other asthma sufferers are probably dealing with. Yeah. And Another key takeaway for listeners here is that notice how we keep saying K2 because the K that you just see a lot of times is K1 and K1 could be found in a lot of our leafy greens and other foods. K2, most likely for us in the States, especially, um, you're going to have a hard time just getting that full amount through food because I think the main f food is it's fermented foods, right? And is it natto? Is that natto? Yeah. yeah. Natto, which is a fermented soybean, common in Japan, very uncommon mm -hmm. in the US. And you are so right, Julian. Here's the thing. K1, K1 is a, a hepatic, so it's a liver-based nutrient. And it's involved in the formation of clotting factors in the liver. It basically resides in the liver. Any other K activity, any other vitamin K activity in the body is going to be K2. And we just don't get enough. Uh, you know, Dark leafy greens are a good source of K1. Uh, and yeah, people do tend to get enough, you know, K1. But K2, fermented foods, organ meats, that's a little weird, right? Mm, and then natto, which most people don't even know what it is. I have had the pleasure of tasting natto. It's not delicious from my perspective, but um, it is a good source. But that's a remote source. So supplementation is the only way to get K2. And it's just a necessary nutrient to add to your supplement regimen, just like it's surprisingly difficult as, as much D2 is out there from a fortification perspective, it's not really helping, nor is spending time in the sun. We have to get away from these sort of antiquated ideas that, oh, I spend plenty of time in the sun, I must be getting enough D. No way, 40% of Americans are deficient in D. In, in senior populations, that number may be high, as high as 65 or 70 percent. In some minority populations, in some specialized populations, it may be as high as 70 or 80 percent. These numbers are, they're just not appropriate given the knowledge base that we have and how easy it is to supplement with nutrients like vitamin D and vitamin K2. There's just no reason why these things shouldn't be promoted and why they shouldn't have been promoted early on in the COVID pandemic. Yep. And also when it comes to vitamin D is the less, the further you are from the equator, the less effective that sun's going to be with the vitamin D. And the next thing is, um, and I see this a lot because of do genetic reports. A lot of people don't have the receptors that's going to be able to absorb that vitamin D. So that's another reason. So you can be tanning and bathing out there, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to translate to healthy blood levels with your vitamin D. And so as we get ready to wind this down, because you're a man in demand now 
with this important subject. And um, listeners, probably the next logical thing is, well, how much should I take? So um, I will say, always group those together, like we said, but what's the general range? And I know it's hard to to give a blanket thing because, you know, I'm, too, I'm, I'm nearly 200 pounds. So my, my amount is going to be different compared to probably someone who's 130 pounds, but what's a general range that you think is a good starting point before having that's to go a, out and test? Yeah, that's really good. And, and we need to talk about that. So my recommendation is uh, vitamin D3, 2000 to 4000 I use a day. Now, I will tell you that I have patients that take 5,000 and in some cases, based on serum testing, you may have to go to higher dosages like 10,000 I use Mm -hmm. to get to sufficiency. But a standard dose, daily dose, I would recommend between 2,000 and 4,000 I use per day. If you've never taken vitamin D3 before, probably 4,000 I use per day is the place to begin. Vitamin D3 is safe and non-toxic. Vitamin K2, I recommend 100 micrograms per day. Now, there are some dosages that go as high as 300 micrograms. Again, vitamin K2 is very safe, very non-toxic, so you can increase the dosage if you so choose. But I believe that 4,000 IUs of D3 and 100 micrograms of K2 per day is kind of an optimal dosage range to get people started to promote their immune function and to give them long-term health in terms of the other benefits that D and K2 provide that include cardiovascular health, optimal bone health, and a a growing body of research that says it assists in performance. Mm -hmm. So the actual function, you know, sports nutrition. So also you mentioned toxicity and and sometimes people think because it's a fat soluble, so it's it's just going to hover in there. This I might have this backwards, but it's hard to get toxic with D3 when you're taking it with K because the vitamin K helps prevent you not getting vitamin D toxicity, right? If you take too much. Is that something like that? So the, the, the idea and the concern really with increasing dosages of vitamin D is the management of calcium. And, and of course, we always have to be concerned about, you know, levels sort of growing in the body, but that's really a vitamin A, not a vitamin D concern. Okay. Uh, dosages, you know, if you go to, if you go to your conventional physician and they determine that you're vitamin D deficient, they can give you a shot of 50,000 IUs of vitamin D in one dosage. So supplementing with 2000 or 4,000 IUs a day is very low compared to what you can get in an injectable form. The idea is this, Julian, If you increase the dosages of vitamin D and you're still deficient in vitamin K2, you're giving the body a problem that it has to deal with. Vitamin D brings calcium into the body. Vitamin K2 puts it into the bones. That's what it's supposed to do. If you're deficient in K2, but sufficient in D, calcium comes in, but guess what? There's not enough K2 to direct it to the bones. So where does it go? Well, it can go into your soft tissues, like your blood vessels, leading to hardening of the arteries. And so we have this relationship, this synergistic relationship between D3 and K2 that has to do with calcium, total calcium management. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to focus not so much on is D3 toxic and does K2 prevent it? No, it's more about getting the total benefits from D3 in terms of calcium management and the role that K2 plays in that regard. And that, that would be the focus for me. Okay. And the last thing here is the recommended supplement protocol that you all laid out. And it was, it was D3, K2, vitamin C, zinc, and an omega-3, right? Yes. Unless you, the omega-3, if you consume a lot of fish like sardines and mackerel, do you think you still need to, would you still supplement? It's the same argument that I would give in terms of overall nutritional supplementation. Mm -hmm. You eat a healthy diet, you do the best you can. You want to maximize and optimize those levels. And yes, I think an omega-3 supplement from either fish or non-marine sources like algal, they're algal source forms for EPA and DHA. I think they're they're critical. Uh, To that list, I would add magnesium and selenium. Okay. There's new research that is focused on that. So if in terms of an immune program, 
if you started off with D3, K2, omega-3 from fish oil, you added vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, and selenium, you have a total package in terms of immune health from a nutritional supplementation perspective. Awesome to hear. That is a great way to wrap this up. I enjoy this conversation. We had a lot of technical difficulties, but we made it work anyway. So thank you for sticking with me. And that's just the life that we live now, you know, with all this virtual world that we live in. So we're going to have mishaps. So thank you so much again. And where can listeners find out, um, check the book out? I know it's at Amazon. Is there anywhere else that you want them to go or is Amazon good? Amazon is great. They can go to simplifyingthecovidpuzzle.com and they can order the book directly. Uh, they can order the audio book as well. And um, we have an ebook for those that want to read it on their reader. So I really appreciate this opportunity, Julian. This was a great conversation. And uh, I would love to talk further uh, when we have more time. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you so much. And listeners, I will have all of that in the show notes. And as always, stay awesome, be limitless. And as always, go be superhuman. Peace.